Welcome to another exciting message from the history of the Baptist. Matthew 16 18 says, uh, You're Peter, but upon this gigantic foundation stone I shall be building my church, and the gates of hell shall not be able to wrestle her down. Matthew 28 18 through 20 says, uh, in King James it says, Go ye therefore, but in the original language it says, After you've been cast out. It was prophecy the church is going to be scattered. God's people are going to be scattered all over. But it says, make disciples. How do you make disciples? Preaching the word. And now what do you do with the disciples? You baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then you teach them to guard with their lives. Terrain is a Hebrew or a Greek word, that is. And uh, guard with their lives all things I've committed unto you. Lo, I'll be with you until the end of the age. The end of the age is over here. The church age. All right, church age started at the seashores of Galilee, not Pentecost. Started at the seashores of Galilee, and spread all the way out to the, to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and His second coming, His rapture. And here we have church history as it is. We're talking about the contributions that Baptists have given to the world and to mankind, all mankind. Period. I don't care whether you're a Mormon or a uh, Pentecostal or what you are, or you old Baptists of great, thank you. Because you wouldn't be able to have freedom of religion at all, right or wrong, unless the Baptists had not died and fought for it. I <clears throat> ask you to continue to ask you for your prayers. I've had COVID for the last week, and, um, and I hope I can make it through without coughing too much tonight. The, uh, the contributions that Baptists have made to the world are astounding. You would not have the Bible. Number one, you wouldn't have a Bible. Number two, you wouldn't have religious liberty and a religious freedom. Even if you're an atheist, you old the Baptist will thank you for that because you couldn't be, a, be an atheist if it wasn't for the Baptist talking about religious freedom, freedom of thought, liberty of conscience. They, uh, <clears throat> we talked about uh, Kerry that went to India and uh, it says here, we're reviewing just a little bit, Kerry perhaps had the greatest facility of learning languages as any man who ever lived. In seven years he learned Hebrew, Greek, Latin, French, and Dutch. Carrie and Thomas, a Baptist surgeon of India, were appointed missionaries and they first attempted to sail to the, in the Earl of Oxford but were prevented by the East India Company. Carrie finally sailed in Danish East Indiamen, the Crown Princess Maria, June the 13th, 1793. He translated the scriptures into all those languages over there so that he could reach them in the how do you make Baptists? You make them by preaching the word. You make it by preaching the word. Baptist churches are the little democratic bodies of believers don't answer to any other church at all. You're, a, you're what we call an individual institution instituted by Christ himself answering to no other powers on earth except Jesus. It says these low-born, low low-bred mechanics have done more to spread the knowledge of the scriptures among the heathen than that has been ever attempted in all the world besides. By the way, you remember uh, many of these people when they went out on the mission field, they were sent out by congregation and everything, they got to read the Bible and they became Baptist. Mm -hmm. William Wilberforce. We talked about the Baptists. They had they, that one of the great Baptist preachers went in and did prison reform and had and started the assemblies in, in prisons where people could go and worship and preach the Word of God in, in prisons. William Wilberforce, what was Wilberforce note, noted for? Stopping the slave trade. Stopping the slave trade. 
said in the House of Commons of Kerry, he had the genius as well as the benevolence to devise a plan of society for communicating the blessings of Christian light to the natives of India. To qualify himself for the uh, for a truly noble enterprise, he had resolutely applied himself to the study of learned languages. The learned languages are, are Greek and Hebrew and Latin. That's the learned languages. That's the educated languages. George Washington would not even write his own speeches because he did not know the learned languages. Mm -hmm. He depended on somebody else to correct and write his speeches for him. He'd put down, they'd put down his ideas, but they would put it down in perfect English form. And after making considerable proficiency in them, applied himself to several of the Oriental tongues, and more especially to Sanskrit, in which his proficiency is acknowledged as greater than that of Sir William Jones, or any other of the Europeans at the time. Now we're going to go, and we're going <clears> to, <throat> the world has been plagued with slavery in America and Europe, and the black slave trade did not end slavery. The black slave trade did not end slavery. In Europe and all the other nations, wherever they were, whether it's a uh, South Pacific, wherever, they sl ended slavery by legislation without civil wars. America uh, elected Abraham Lincoln and he started the war, basically, that's what he did. It wasn't over slavery to be ended up, but his excuse for that war later on was slavery. Now, in schools, Today, we have children in schools, don't we? You know, back in this period of time here, when children were four and five years old, they went to work. They went to work. They went to work in factories and coal mines or whatever. They went to work. They helped feed the families because the minimum wage was so little and so small that everybody in the family, a man wanted to have ten kids to help the ten kids help him feed himself and his wife and the other kids. And they hoped they had boys, because boys could get out and work. The girls worked in sometimes in the, the factories where they did needlework and sewing and things like that. But they did it in America, and they did it in Europe, all over Europe. They did this. Children became slaves of the great monopolies of that time, the industries of that time. Now. We're going to read about this a little bit now. <clears throat> we're going to come to this where we start Sunday schools. Sunday schools were started to teach children how to read and write and to get out of the slave sweatshops. Simple as that. The defeat with the defeat of Antoninianism and under the impulse of missionary propaganda, there was a renewed desire and ready and read to read and study the Bible. Now let's look at antonomenialism, by the way. It comes from two Greek words, anti, against, and nomos, against the law. Now, the Baptists were called antimonians in early times because they believe in salvation by grace. They, didn't, they told you that you didn't have to be baptized by the Catholic Church or the Presbyterian. You didn't have to go through these holy rituals or anything like that, confirmation or whatever. When you come to the Lord Jesus Christ and ask Him to save your soul, you were saved forevermore. That was it. There was a change of life. There was a, a newness of spirit in you. But you were saved from now on. Now, d down through history, the Gnostics and, uh, and several other groups in, the, in early Christianity uh, believed after they were saved they could do anything they wanted to and it was okay. That Christ had nailed the law to his, the cross. Well, He did. But there's also the knowledge and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your lives that leads you into righteousness and truth and morality, so to speak. Now, the Antoniumism of the missionary propaganda, there were renewed desire to read the study of the Bible. Remember, the Anabaptists were called Antimonians. The Gnostics were called this also. The Gnostics, the problem with them was they didn't believe that Jesus Christ was 
God the Son, and died on the cross and resurrected. With this began another movement which was destined to exercise the most beneficial influence upon the human race in every part of the globe, the whole world. Towards the close of the 18th century, a great want of Welsh Bibles was felt by ministers of religion in that country, these Welsh Bibles. By the way, the people that came to America, the Baptists that came to America, came from Wales and England. Wales and England. Later on, as Mennonites and Amish, they came from wherever. They had been scattered from the days of the of the Islamic and the Roman, uh, the Islamic uh, wars and the Roman wars, the Roman Catholic wars. Neither one of them were any good. Few families were in possession of a single copy of the Holy Scriptures. But Baptists had to die because they had one page of the Bible. For hundreds of years this happened. The Catholic Church had absolutely forbidden the Bible at 1229, but they didn't want anybody to have it way back yonder, all the way to the Waldenses and the Montanists and the Paterines and the Cathari. Now here we're going to go something. We're going to learn something about printing now. Printing of Bibles. I probably have 20 Bibles at least. I've got... Uh, Latin, a Greek, Hebrew, and then many translations of the scriptures also. They didn't have anything like this back then. Everything was handwritten. My translation of the scriptures in the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation are all handwritten by me. And the translations are handwritten. All the page numbers and everything are there. You learn the Bible as it is not as it is interpreted. This, another move, movement which is destined to exercise the most beneficial influence upon the human race in every part of the globe, towards the close of the 18th century, a great want of West Bibles was felt by ministers and religion uh, a necessity. Few families were in possession of a single copy of the Holy Scriptures. So urgent was the need of a supply that the Reverend Thomas Charles came to London to place a matter before some religious people there. Having been introduced to the committee, the Religious Tract Society, of which Reverend Joseph Fuse, a Baptist minister, was secretary. Now we're going to begin the British Bible Tract Society. Because the reason why you got Bibles in your hands, and this isn't King James Bible, by the way. These are not King James Bible, these are Baptist Bibles. King James Bible is a Church of England Bible, not a Baptist book. That there might be a similar dearth in all the parts of the country and that it would be desirable to form a society for the express purpose of circulating the scriptures. Inquiries were made throughout England as, as well as upon the continent and it was found that the people everywhere were destitute of the Bible. Religion without the Bible was, was the common thing. Religion without a Bible. Would you like to have a religion and you didn't have a Bible to back up what you're thinking and what you're teaching in your religion? Well, that's what happened for so many years. Religion without a Bible. The Catholics wanted their religion without the Bible. They wanted it that way. The Church of England didn't want their people going back to the Catholic Church, so they had the King James version of the Bible in 1611 printed and it was very biased toward the Church of England. It put out their platforms and their dogmas and their doctrines. Baptism for, baptism for the remission of the sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism by sprinkling and uh, pouring, not immersion later on. Having introduced the committee of the Religious Tract Society by the Reverend Joseph Hughes, a Baptist minister, was secretary, and there might be a similar dearth in other parts of the country that it would be desirable to form a society for the exact express circus or purpose of circulating the scriptures. Inquiries were made throughout England, as well as upon the continent. And it was found that the people everywhere were destitute of the Bible, and the result was the formation of the British and Foreign Bible Society. This is how it happened, and it was done by Baptists. 
I have a lot of books and my a lot of Bibles in there, and some of them are printed by the British and Foreign Bible Society. Mr. Hughes was elected secretary. I am thankful for my intimacy with him, with his friend Lee Fitzchild said. My esteem of him always grew with inter intercourse. I never knew a more consistent, correct, unblemished character. He was not only a sincere, but without offense, and adorned in the doctrine of God our Savior and all the things. His mind was full of information, singularly instructive, and very edifying. And while others talked of candor and moderation, he, he, he exemplified them. <clears throat> Still got a sore throat here. Mr. Hughes prepared a prize essay on the excellency of the Holy Scriptures, an argument for their more general dispersion, and the circulation of this essay led to the formation of the Society in March the 4th, 1804. At the London Tavern, Bishopicot Street, Mr. Hughes originated the Society and gave it its name and became its first secretary. At this meeting, it was agreed. Number one, the Society shall be formed with the designation of the British and Foreign Bible Society of which the sole object shall be to encourage wider dispersion of the Holy Scriptures. This society shall add to its endeavors to those employed by the societies for circulating scriptures throughout the British domains and dominions, and shall, according to ability, extend its influence to other countries, whether Christian, Mohammedans, are pagans. Now, Islam was not used back that time. It was called Mohammedans. The religion of the of the uh, of Muhammad would call the Mohammedans. This institution was established. More than seven hundred pounds were subscribed to its maintenance. And the first historian, John Owen, John Owen is a famous famous name in Baptist history. Thus terminated the proceedings of the extraordinary day, a day memorable in experience of all who participated in the transaction by which it signa signalized a day to which posterity will look back as giving the world in that times of singular perturbation and uh, distress in institutions for diffusing on the grandest scale the tidings of peace and salvation. A day which will be recorded as a peculiar honorable to the character of Great Britain and as fixing an important epoch in the history of mankind. Owens, the history of the origin of the ten years of the Bible and British Bible and Tract Society. The institution of Sunday schools was also dates back to this same period of time, the institution of Sunday schools. These are the Baptist contributions to humanity. Sunday school is one of them. Now the year was 1780, that Robert Rakes, the proprietor and editor of the Glusher <coughs> Lucaster Journal, has attention drawn to ignorance, ignorance and depravity of children of Gloucester. <coughs> the ignorance and depravity of them. Children, when they were five years old, had to go out and work like a man, like an adult. Now, when they did that, they came back smoking, they came back cussing, they came back drinking from that time on because they figured they were adults so they could do what the adults did. And they were a godless little people and slaves. A society shall be forced to uh, this designation, the scriptures. The institution of Sunday schools also dates from this period of time. In 1780, Robert Wakes, a proprietor and editor of the Cloakester Journal, had his attention drawn to the ignorance, depravity of the children of Gloucester. The streets of the lower part of the town were informed, were filled on Sunday with multitudes of these wretches, released on that day from their employment and spent their time in noise, riot, 
playing at Kinnick and cursing and swearing. Rakes at once conceived the idea of employing persons to teach these children on Sunday. They were going to teach them reading and writing on Sunday. This wasn't Sunday school as it is, but they got Sunday off because that was considered the Sabbath, even though it wasn't. The idea was carried into execution. At the end of three years, he wrote to a friend. <clears throat> it is now three years since we began. I wish you were here to make inquiry into the effect that it has done. A woman who lives in a lane where I had fixed a school told me some time ago that the place was as quiet as heaven on Sundays compared to what it was used to be. The numbers who have learned to read and say catechism are so great that I am astonished at it. Upon the Sunday afternoon the mistress take their scholars to church and place into which neither they nor their ancestors ever entered with view of the glory of God. Now, the Baptists were thinking about this at the same time. Now they gave them what we call a sectarian education. But they took them to church because going to church was established by law. They had to do this. These were the loud laws. They weren't going to church. Their parents weren't going to church. They were starving in slavery, basically. The school of Rakes was not a Sunday school, but a school which taught reading and writing and catechism of the Church of England and marched the children to church on Sunday afterwards because they were a member of the church in the state. Mr. Rakes does not appear to have expected that this system would have generally be adopted. William Fox, a Baptist deacon of London, had the honor of giving universality to the Sunday school. He became interested in the movement and proposed the Sunday School Society. The Sunday School Society is going to teach the people the Bible, not the catechism. The catechism is the doctrines of the, of the Church of England or the doctrines of Catholicism. Teaching people the Bible, that's how you make Baptists. Baptist. Why am I a Baptist? Because the Bible made me that way. History makes me that way. I'm a full admiration at the great rights, Mr. Rakes to Mr. Fox, and the noble design of the society you have speak of for me. If it were possible, my poor abilities could be rendered in any degree useful to you and point out the subject, and you will find me not inactive. This was quoted in the Baptist magazine. The Sunday School Society, which had been such signal use in England, was organized in the Prescott Street Baptist Church in London, September the 7th, 1785. Sunday School was established September the 7th, 1785, in the Prescott Street Baptist Church in London. Fox placed the Sunday School under voluntary instead of paid teachers. And he had the Bible taught instead of secular studies and dogmas of the Catholic or the Church of England. The modern Sunday School and its development had originated with the Baptists in London. It must be sometimes said that on account of their opposition to infant baptism, the position of the Baptists included a harsh attitude toward the young. But they are not indifferent to the, to the conversion of little children. The covenants of Baptist churches so far back as we can be traced pledge each member to bring up his, all, his offspring in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. This was manifested in the lives of these English Baptists. Benjamin Keats, born in 1640, suffered at the pillory of order under judges for writing and published a book entitled The Child's Instructor. And he was placed in prison for two months and forced to pay a fine of 100 pounds. That's a lot of money, people. He was converted at 18 and was pastor in London at the age of 28. He was converted at 18. John Gill, born in 1697, the great commentator, was converted when he was 12 years of age and at 23 was a succession of Keech. 
John Rippon, born 1751, the successor of Gill, was converted when he was 16 and was licensed to preach at Bristol College when he was 17. And he was chosen to succeed the great Gill at 20 years of age, and John Ryland, born 1755, was converted when he was but 14 years and ordained when he was 18. Joseph Stennett, born 1692, was converted at 15 and was ordained as pastor of Little Wilds Church when he was only 22. Samuel Sennett, born in 1727, the son of the successor of the above, was converted and baptized when he was quite young. Robert Hall, a great name, was born in 1764 and was converted at the age of nine, began to preach at 15, and was assistant pastor of the Broadmead Church. Bristol, before he reached his majority, Andrew Fuller, born 1754, was converted at 14 years of age, baptized at 16, and ordained at 21. This is a list of distinguished Baptist preachers and converted when young and could be indefinitely extended from over and over and over and over again. I was saved when I was about 11 years old, 12 years old. And I knew from that period of time on that God was going to call me to preach. Didn't do it for years to come. Out of the same general awakening, Stephen College, now Regents Park College, owes its origin. Its foundation is due to the Abraham Booth. No institution has done more for the service of Baptists in England than, he, than this one. For more than 30 years, the celebrated Joseph Angus was its president. He was a profound scholar, a forceful writer, and a member of the committee of that revised the New Testament, the revised New Testament. The revised standard version of the revised New Testament. At age 22, he was pastor of the church honored by the ministrations of Dr. Gill and Rupon and that was in later days received additional fame from the ministry of Charles H. Spurgeon. Charles H. Spurgeon. Charles Haddon Spurgeon. One of the greatest preachers in history. The work of the vision occupied much of his best thought and labor for 10 years, 1770 to, to 1870 to 1880, and to the enthusiasm which it so continually tasked and inspired was added to the delight of intercourse with scholars from almost every section of the religious community. The Revised Standard Version was a compilation of all of these great Baptist preachers. I hear some of you out there propagating King James, you don't know where that thing came from. That came from the Church of England. Baptists died because of the printing of that book. Now the Baptists start this British Foreign Bible Society printing Bibles. Now they're going to make a translation that is closer to the original language. Besides Bristol and Midland College at the foundation, which have already been mentioned, the Baptists of England have Rowdell College, A.D. 1804, the Pastors College, 1861, and Manchester College in 1866. English Baptists have abounded and as, as able offers, authors. Note can be made of only two or three of here. John Foster was a writer of essays. Sir James McIntosh, uh, declares that he was one of the most profound and eloquent writers in England that has ever England has ever produced. Aubrey, in his Rise of the English Nation, makes the reference to John Foster. The Eclectic Review, for a length of time, swayed literary and political opinions. Many through the splendid articles and nearly 200 in number attributed to John Foster. Baptist Contributions to Humanity. Mm -hmm. The Bible. Freedom of speech. Freedom of thought. Freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. Sunday school. Prison reform. Macintosh, one of the profound and eloquent writers in England that has produced his life and, and correspondence by Ryland ranks among the classics. No song book could be complete that did not conclude Blessed Be the Tie by John Fawcett and How Firm the Foundation by George Keith. The English Baptists have always had able, cultured, and eloquent preachers. 
they have produced three of the greatest preachers of all time. Robert Hall has been pronounced the greatest preacher that ever used the English lane tongue. And no generation will forget Charles H. Spurgeon and Alexander McLaren. These are great men of God. These, these men of God were supported by churches of God. Churches that belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and they were Baptist churches. This is what we've learned from history. That you wouldn't have any freedom of religion, you wouldn't have separation of church and state without the Baptist people. They are the ones that gave you these freedoms. No one else stood for these freedoms in history. All of the rest of them believed in, in the church and state marriage. Baptists separated, divorced the church from the state and their churches. And in America today, every colony at one time in America was a state church. You had to pay your taxes. You had to go to that church by means of force or else fine, fining or imprisonment. Baptists, even though they went to church, their own churches, were fined, beaten, and tortured, and robbed, and their properties were confiscated, but they did not falter, they did not waver, they preached the Word of God. Our Father, we send this message out to your people wherever they are in the world. Help them understand why, what they believe and why they believe it, and how that this great legacy was handed down to them, the gift to society and humanity by the Baptist people. Father, please forgive me where I fail you. Thank you for your son that gave his life for us all, that touched us with your spirit, convicts us with your spirit, loves us and adds us to your family and to your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray.